You and I know that when people attack the veracity of the Bible, they usually wind up becoming believers. That's right. <laughs> because it's bulletproof. That's right. And so I honestly believe that his word from Genesis to Revelation is speaking to us. And I believe that it answers every situation of our human existence. Every question that man can think up, the Bible will have the answer to that. Well, it's great that we live in Southern California yeah. together. And I love that you're not like one of the rats jumping off the sinking ship of California. You're saying, I'm here to stay, why? Here to stay, number one, uh, it's my home. I believe God planted me here for a reason. Second thing, it's where I got my calling from the Lord to stand and preach the gospel. And then finally, of course, I can't think of a greater place than to fight and defend gospel truth, the biblical worldview, than Southern California. We're the laughing stock of the nation because we're so messed up. That's where the Christians should be preaching, mm. should be teaching, should be shining the light. I mean, it's a dark place, so let's shine it. Now, you know, when I, saw, when I saw the boots, I should have known that you'd have a perspective <laughs> like that. Hey, you're, you're leaning in. You're, you're not on the defense. Uh, you're not running from the trouble. You are leaning into the trouble, yeah. and you're leading the way out yeah. of it. Yeah. I love that. It's the way to live. It is the way to live. Jack, you've been, a, you've been a pastor for 30 years now, and I've been to your church many times. My yeah. kids have gone to your church, and I just see the spiritual life there. It's thriving. That's not a church that's just barely surviving, even through the pandemic. It was thriving and was even growing during that time uh, be, because of your leadership. Um, but needs within the church today, I think, are different than when you first started, right? When you were in your living room. Oh, yeah. Uh, what have you seen change in terms of what people need out of a church today? Yeah, this is a great question, by the way. Uh, the need has changed because the days have gotten exactly what the Bible said, more difficult. The Bible mm -hmm. says in the last days, perilous times will come. So what do we see statistically? What do we see in our culture? What do we see in our educational system and our politics? What do we see in what is called church today is a rapid decline or departure from a biblical worldview. So for mm -hmm. us, Standing in the Word of God, I, I'm so grateful, Kirk, that the way that I was brought up at Calvary Chapel Costa Mesa under Chuck Smith was the Word of God. That's the standard foundation. Yeah. So we've never moved. We've never moved. What's happened is that the culture around us has moved. Uh, the anchor stays the same. So when it gets darker, the, that light that we were talking about earlier shines brighter. And so we've seen people gravitate now with bigger problems, more of them. And yet the beauty is the answer is still the word of God. So you mentioned how the ministry has, has expanded. It's because the need has heightened at a time like this. Thank God that his word is eternal. It's still the answer today. And people are waking up to, I want truth. Jack, in the Bible, God uses uh, the word shepherd mm. to refer to pastors. And, th and that's what you are. You're, you're shepherding uh, the sheep of God's flock, his people, his family. Um, what's the best part of being a shepherd and what's the hardest part about being a shepherd? Uh, I think it's actually one and the same thing. Um, there's an intense burden. I believe that if you're called to uh, the pastoral ministry to shepherd people, it's very clear from scripture that you are to tend to them and to teach them. And so what happens, Kirk, is that you become burdened with their burdens. So that's a tough part, but that's the very, very uh, part that causes you to speak into their life with the word of God. I have to remember something always. A good friend of mine who was a doctor who's in heaven now reminded me, Jack, you can't. You've got to point them to the cross. You've got to love them to the cross and to the word of God. But, but like a physician, um, you, can't, you didn't die for them. You didn't go to the cross for them. You've got to give them to Jesus. So that's in right. every message, every sermon, every Wednesday, every Sunday, every wherever, that's my thing, is to deliver his truth to them. And the outcome has got to be based upon them and God. Would I rather put them in a headlock and make them say the sinner's prayer? <laughs> well, the, the emotion is there to do that, but I can't. Our God is relational, he's personal, and they've got to come to him personally. It's not, it's not a Costco type of salvation. You need to know him directly. And so that's my burden, is to teach them the word of God, trust the Holy Spirit to do the rest. I, I am the, the delivery boy. 
You also have a podcast, you're on TV, and have a radio program. Uh, and in your podcast, uh, the Jack Hibbs podcast, you say, when I get up in the morning to read my Bible, I expect it to answer for me the issues that I'm going to confront today. D- do you really believe that God is going to speak to you through the pages of his word every day? Literally every day. And the more those days go by, the more that's true in my life. The truth is always there. It doesn't change. But as I conform more to his image by his grace, Kirk, I got to tell you, if I, I, I actually believe that when I open up the Bible for the day, mm-hmm. that the events of my life that day, it's going to incorporate the Bible. This is where I get to have boldness in God's word and in the calling for being a believer. I th- kind of think, I joke with the congregation that a lot of this is rigged. We've got the truth. He knows what's next. We're to go along with what he presents to us. Mm. I love this, and uh, I I want you to justify this. You say that my Bible deals with politics, it deals with worldviews, it deals with economics, relationships, the saved and the unsaved. What books of the Bible are you talking about? Uh, Just Genesis through Revelation. Okay, it's everywhere. Only 66 books of the Bible, which speak in perfect cohesion. Mm. Authored, you know, some 40 different authors, right? 66 books, not one of them contradict one another. It's a testimony of the authenticity of God. And on top of it, what God did is that the scripture says that it's breathed by the Holy Spirit, but yet it has the personality of Paul in his authorship. It has the personality of Peter in his authorship or Matthew or Luke or Isaiah for that matter. So no, God who is the creator, who is the savior of the world, the Alpha and the Omega has preserved for us the Bible. This is what's awesome about our scriptures is for thousands of years, people have been attacking the Bible. And if somebody could come up with a real bona fide target hit Mm -hmm. on why the Bible cannot be trusted, they'd be a billionaire. But you and I know that when people attack the veracity of the Bible, they usually wind up becoming believers. That's right. Because it's bulletproof. (laughs) That's right. And so I honestly believe that his word from Genesis to Revelation is speaking to us. And I believe that it answers every situation of our human existence. Every question that man can think up, the Bible will have the answer to that. So, so the obvious pushback is, well, if God is speaking, speaking with such unity on issues, uh, even controversial issues like politics, um, then why is it that when we as Christians talk about politics, it tends to divide us rather than bring us back together? Yeah, yeah, why? Yeah, why? Yeah, why? <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah, why are we, are we just case? misunderstanding God's word? I, <clears throat> are I, there don't lin- know, I don't know if we're misunderstanding it or if, if some are choosing to not obey it. Oh, yeah, I see what you're saying. I mean, saying. I think if we look at, I mean, look at, look at the life. I mentioned Isaiah. Look at Isaiah's life and what he went through. What about Ezekiel? Look, we want to do a Bible study on Jeremiah, uh, but look what Jeremiah went through. All of these men struggled with the word of God that was in them, but they were commissioned to speak to the public square. That's not changed. Jesus said, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. We don't get that in the West, Kirk. The Middle Eastern listener, they know exactly what that means. We rarely hear it taught in in the West. When Jesus said, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's to God the things that are God's, the people were in awe because the answer was this. Caesar belongs to God. It's not a separation of church and state, so to speak, or this is secular and this is sacred. Jesus said something that they all recognized was the true answer. Whose image is this? Whose coin does this belong to? The actual Mm. answer was, God, Caesar, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. And you all guys, all you guys know, right? That Caesar belongs to God. Rome belongs to God. The world belongs to God. Mm. Caesar's palace, Caesar's salad, all belongs to God. 